Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Business Alchemy, where I have the amazing guest, Angela Eschler of Eschler Editing. And I've known Angela for a couple of years, and we've had many conversations over those years about self-publishing, traditional publishing, what really makes an engaging book, and all the questions you can imagine for entrepreneurs to build their platform using a book. So that is the rich conversation we're going to have today. So welcome, Angela. I'm so thrilled that you're here. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be talking to you. Well, let's talk a little bit about you know, how you got started or something that you shared with me, um, that you had customers before you had a business. <laughs> and so you wrote your own book, and then you're like, hey, wait, I actually know a lot about this. And the business came after, kind of after the fact. But tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are, because you are, like, you've got an amazing team. When you're, you know, for those of you who are listening, when you want, whether it's self-publishing or traditional publishing, like, Angela and Eschler Editing, like, they are your go-to people. I've been so impressed with the products that I've seen of mutual colleagues that we have in common and just your passion and your care for the books that you are helping people produce. So tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got to be doing this (laughs) as your business. Thank you. Thanks so much, Angela. That's so kind. Um, Yeah, so this is kind of a funny backwards way, but um, I'm guessing a lot of entrepreneurs might kind of fall into things of this nature. So um, ever since I was a little kid, you know, I loved to read. That's all I wanted to do is read and, you know, write. And in fourth grade, I thought I was going to be a novelist, right? So I wrote my first novel in fourth grade. So I've always loved, you know, I was like 100 pages and it was about someone from Finland who got sucked into ancient Egypt. I'm sure it would have been a bestseller. (laughs) But um, anyway, so I've always, I've just, from the time I was very little, I knew that I loved words and I loved stories. And those were the two biggest passions of my life. So I grew up and I went to college and I, of course, was going to be an English major. And my dad, of course, was like, you can't make any money. You can't get a job being an English major. (laughs) And so I was like, I don't care. That's what I'm doing. So, you know, I followed the bliss, followed the passion kind of a thing. Um, But what I found is that sometimes that following your bliss and following your passion, you know, a lot of people talk about that, how you should just, if you just do what you love, it'll happen. And that can be the case, but sometimes what you love might have multiple facets to it and you can work in a different area of what you love. So a lot of writers, writing is kind of a hard thing to break into for like traditional publishing. Like it was a really long slog for a lot of people, you know, to become incredibly good at it. There's a lot of luck involved and this is mostly kind of in the fiction and and before the self-publishing era. Right. And so, um, as I got done with college, I didn't really know if that's the route that I wanted to take. And there was one at the time you didn't, they didn't have degrees in editing. They do now. They have degrees in editing. But at the time, there was one class right as I was graduating that was about editing. And so I was like, okay, I'll take this and see where it goes. Well, obviously, it ended up me going, that's the best career in the entire world. You get paid to read books, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, um, sign me up. <laughs> But, you know, even that was kind of a competitive field at the time because you could only work for traditional publishers. There was nothing else out there. And so you had to be one of the few people that, you know, you would start, if you were really lucky, you could get an internship in New York and start as a super lowly proofreader who just corrected commas and spend years doing that, right? Um, And so I, I really lucked out. I had an editing job that was in the corporate and IT world for a long time with businesses. And then there was like that dot com bubble. And kind of everything crashed and lots of people lost their jobs. And I was in that group of people who lost their jobs. And um, my uncle was a writer who'd made it. And he had mentioned that there was a publisher he knew that he could maybe pull some strings and, and let me try out or get an internship or something. And so I was able to get that. And over time, like as a freelancer, they liked my work. And eventually when a job opened up, I got a job at a traditional publisher being on the editorial staff. And so over time, I was able to um, move my way up to senior editor, and you have to learn all these different skill sets because there's multiple different kinds of editing and whatnot. Um, And so I was really, really loving that. And then I got to a point after almost a decade where it's really long hours at a publisher, and um, my husband was getting a PhD and working full-time, and so we basically both got home at midnight every night and maybe said hello before we fell asleep, and then we were both gone before the dawn again the next day. And after several years of this, we went, 
well, this is fun, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and who are you again? Oh, okay. You yeah. know, most of our conversations were fighting over who was going to do the dishes in the 10 minutes that anyone was home, right? Mm. And so we decided that if we wanted to, like, start a family and have someone be home, and, and his elderly parents were going to start needing care at that time. He was the only child. So we decided that I would make the very, very scary decision to quit my reliable job and try to freelance, just be self-employed. And um, and so we did that. And, of course, right when we did that is when the huge economy crashed and the housing market and everything. <laughs> yeah, right, of course. Me, right? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. is when I got laid off. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. And so we went, oh, we just gave up a reliable job, and now our house is 70000 underwater. And, you know, so mm -hmm. the the financial adventure, you know, was definitely very high pressure, right? <laughs> Um, so we kind of started everything from that scrabbling place of, oh, we have to survive. And so it ended up being that um, the reason I ended up getting a, of customers before I had a business is that I just emailed everyone I knew that was in the author and writing world and said, um, I'm doing freelance editing. If anyone knows an editor trying or, you know, knows a writer trying to break in that's not quite getting there, that needs help understanding how to make their book better, or to, you know, to get to those gatekeepers and, and so people started sending me clients or calling to see if I could do things. And eventually um, I would get people who wanted to be clients that were in books that I didn't have an expertise in. So they'd either be a book about computer programming for dummies or they'd be about, I don't know, gun history or something, right? <laughs> and I'm not the right editor for that. But it seemed like a shame to turn away business and not help people. And I knew tons of editors. And so what happened is I started getting so much business that I, I couldn't do it. And so I would call my editing friends and say, hey, do you want to sort of subcontract for me? And I'll manage this job and, you know, gather the invoices and deal with the money and any PR with the client, but you can do the work. And so from there, it spread to that to when the self-publishing world came about. Um, then everybody was like, well, do you know anyone that can design a book or design a cover? Or how do I get self-published? And I did know all those people because I'd worked in traditional publishing. So eventually I just kept calling people and saying, do you want to be part of my team? And after a while I was like, so I guess I have a business and I should probably learn how to run a business. <laughs> so that's how I accidentally yeah. ended up running a publishing group and an editing group. And, and everything we've done since is I just fell into it because I knew people that had the skills that customers wanted. So well, it worked out good. eventually. Yeah, well, let me just uh, pop really quickly because I want to pull this out and highlight it. Is you know when we you know I talk about marketing all the time, as you know, and most people they they just cringe when they hear the word marketing. They're like, oh, I don't want to mm -hmm. do that because they haven't had the best results with it, or they spent a lot of money and time and the outcome, or they just avoid it completely. But really, what you did when you emailed your network and said, hey, this is what I'm doing. Do you know of anyone who will like, <laughs> be you know benefit from the service? Right. That's marketing at its like at its most basic level of just letting people know what it is that you're doing. That's it. Yes. And so many people are their best kept secret. And I can relate with that because I actually just had the epiphany of like, oh my gosh, I haven't let people know about a new service that I'm offering. And like, oh, I haven't let people know. I kept telling myself I've got to update out on my website and send an email. And it's like, well, wait, wait a second. So I personally just got a really big reminder of like, oh yeah, I can just go you know, to people that I know and say, oh, did you know that I offer this? Who do you know who would benefit from it? So just yes. for those of you listening, it's just like, what if it could be that easy? Just to let yes. people know, like, this is what's happening. Who do you know? Can be open and I, I really, that. yeah, I really agree with you on that. And that's something, you know, I've gone to some of your events, and there's some points you've made that really stuck with me about that, about just talking to people. Um, I've been amazed over the years of everything that I've had to learn about marketing and everything else. What it, when you finally kind of learn it all and it becomes unscary because you finally see how all the pieces fit together and you get what the point of it is, then it comes back down to, it's almost hilarious, but it just comes back down to that core of communicating with people. And you might be able to communicate a little bit more succinctly, right, and a little bit more tightly. But um, instead of rambling about what you do, you might figure out how to put it into a couple of sentences. But in the end, that's really all you're learning to do is just to talk to people and almost, I will be honest with you, 99% of our marketing is literally just talking to people. Not sales calls. We don't do cold calls. Just 
we're at conferences, we're at events, we're talking to authors, and they refer people to us. So 99% of our business is referral. And so I'm just working on the official marketing a little bit on the side here and there to finally get into the online world. But almost everything has come from just talking to people. Yeah. Yeah. You said a term before we started recording today, you said um, living room strategies. But I just talk to people in your living room, like that kind of a conversation. Um, I actually just had a conversation with someone, you know, he does something very different, I do something different. And I just happened to mention, the, you know, my expertise with live events. He said, hey, I have, like, I've been asked to consult for this event and I want to bring you in. And it was just that it happened through a conversation. Either of us yes. were there to sell each other. Like, hey, what are you up to? How can I support you? What am I up to? How can you support me? And those yeah. kinds of connection conversations, you just it's been amazing what can show up. But the point being is you have to talk to people. And mm-hmm. also, I think, talk to people without an agenda of just, hey, how can I you yeah. know, contribute to you? How can I support you? And if not, cool, you now know what I do and vice versa. It can just really be that simple. Yes, very much. I agree with that wholeheartedly. If you... If you look at business as a way to serve people and to make connections and and, uh, have relationships in your life instead of how can I make my next buck, so many more things come to you that way because people sense that sincerity, you know, and they're interested in, they really think you want to help them instead of sell them something. Right, right. And I think this is a really great lead in into how do you market your book because I know that you've seen it, something that we've talked about is People think a book is going to make it. Like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be a best-selling author and I'm going to make it. And it's like, very few authors are actually millionaires. You know, they're, mm-hmm. then I'm, I'm just going to say it this way. It's like, and it might not be the most popular way to say it, but there are a lot of broke authors because they're not marketing and they're not actually putting their book out there. And so if you use the same strategy of like, okay, you've got a book, it's brilliant. And how can you leverage the relationships so that you can get your book into more people's hands and really be the contribution you want to be in the world. Like, it could be that easy. It doesn't have to be a big, fancy book launch campaign. It can be. And Mm -hmm. how can you nurture relationships that they want to share your book with their communities Mm -hmm. and their followings and their audiences and things that way? Mm -hmm. But let's let's back up a second before we get into the marketing (laughs) books. Like, that's probably a whole other, you know, podcast and training that we could do. Right. But how, you know, we've talked about, like, how to write a book that touches people and really um, how to really inspire people. And if you want to just take a minute and just talk about the power of vulnerability in yeah. your writing and how that is, how that you're seeing that is helping people's books stand out when it's kind of like information products or digital products in the online marketing world. It's the same thing with books. Like, there are a lot of people publishing so how do you make your book stand out? Which, again, we don't have the time to go into detail with that, but you've talked about the power of vulnerability. Tell us a little bit more about that. Right. So I would say, and this, you know, if you're writing something that's almost memoir in nature, I mean, obviously the vulnerability is going to play into that very heavily. But even if you're writing something that's a little bit more of a how-to, um, the vulnerability is still in being honest about your journey and what you learned and how you learned it and also stories of other people that have learned it in powerful ways. Um, Something I've noticed is, you know, so much of online marketing is that um, I'm a brilliant person who made $5 million in 10 minutes and now I'm going to teach you how to. These huge flashy promises that imply that apparently there's no work at all that goes into running a business. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And, um, and so much of that is, um, just really unappealing. Um, and I've listened to a lot of those seminars and I've seen lots of those kinds of books. And what I've noticed is that they're not very honest about what it takes to implement those things and the background learning you need to have them to accurately apply them. And they don't make the person talking to you seem like a real person. They really just do seem like I'm a robot selling you something. <laughs> and so there's a huge lack of trust that goes into that. Um, when you write a book where you're honestly trying to help people and you've got compelling stories of other people who are very similar to your reader, who've had insights or discovered things or had transformations, and you have your own true stories of the real struggles that you had, the real vulnerabilities, um, people sense that, that you're a real person, you're an individual, you have, they can sense that true motive that you're trying to help them. And that you're not trying to be the know-it-all flashy person with the one answer. That you're saying, this was my journey in my path, and here's how it helped me. And if it helps you, then that would be great. And people realize that they can take that and figure out what of it applies to their unique situation. 
because they don't feel like it's the magic formula that you have to follow all five steps in the exact same way or you won't be able to replicate their magic, right? And so what I've seen is that when people share the unique details that had to do with their journey, that's when the book becomes universal in application because it's that journey of the heart, like the emotional struggles, the hopes, the ambitions, like the things that you keep hidden in your heart that you're embarrassed if they don't go well, those are the things that we all are feeling and that we all connect to each other on across the globe. And so those things are going to speak to people because even if you're in a different country with a different kind of story, um, the emotional journey that you went through is going to apply to theirs. And that's powerful for people. Even if you're teaching basic how-tos, they will sense that and they will understand that and it will be a more powerful experience for them to learn those how-tos through that kind of narrative than something straightforward or flashy and big promises. Yeah. Well, and what you're describing for those of you who are familiar with the marketing archetypes, you're describing the difference between guru marketing, guru star marketing, and truth guide marketing. Mm -hmm. And I want to just uh, bring in an example of, you know, there's a book, and I cannot, Mike, someone, I can't remember his last name, he also uh, wrote the toilet paper entrepreneur, but he wrote the book Profit First. Mm-hmm. And and it's a, a money book. It's about, you know, how to set up accounts and what to pay off first. Like, it's a really phenomenal principle, but it's very heady yeah. as well. It's like, you yeah. know, but I'm listening to the audio version of it, and one of the things he did I thought was brilliant is when he did the audio version of his book, he says right up front, he said, yeah, I'm going to read my book to you, and because you're listening to the audio, I'm going to add a few stories that you're not going to find in the book. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was brilliant. But also in his book, he talks about the vulnerability. He talks mm-hmm. about, you know, the moment his daughter brings out with his, her, you know, piggy bank and going, well, maybe this will help because he just admitted to his family, oh. like, yeah, there's no money left. Oh. Like, I don't know what we're going to do. You know, I'm sitting and I was listening to right. the audio version of this on a plane going, holy crap. Like, even though I didn't have a kid who brought in their piggy bank, like, I've had those experiences earlier on in my business, especially of, like, yeah, there's no money, and having that conversation with my husband, and had he not shared that story, I would have been like, it's one more money book. It's one more thing. You can tell me all the details, yeah. but there was a connection, and it was like yeah. he was talking right to me. So I just wanted to use that as an example for those, you know, anyone who would like to do the audio version. Like, I love the fact that I could hear him talk about things that I couldn't read in the book. Like, it was right. really actually brilliant marketing strategy. So I know that we could talk about, you know, the power of vulnerability and how to make a book that stands out. Again, this is, you know, we could talk for hours about that. But let's go into one of the top questions that I get from people, and I ask you, is traditional publishing versus self-publishing? Like, is it even possible to get published by a traditional author without a lot of money or a lot of connections? Um, so trying to be traditionally published today is... Um, very highly competitive, even more so. And and ironically, it's, you know, because of the self-publishing world, um, there are always gatekeepers in traditional publishing. But because of the self-publishing world, the competition now is so much steeper because there are a million books coming out a year instead of, say, 400,000. And so publishers have doubled down on um, what they will take and what they will give a chance to because they have even less of a chance of a return on their investment because there's so much out in the market now that they have to compete with. So I, we, we do tell people that um, traditional publishing has a lot of benefits. There are um, the publishers going to have um, connections with distributors and with marketing that are pretty hard to make if you're just self-publishing as a brand new newbie. So there are reasons to go ahead and, and try to get traditionally published. But what you need to know is that if you're in the business, you know, if you're in some sort of nonfiction market other than memoir, um, they generally want to see that you have a platform and that you have an audience nowadays. It used to be mostly about how good the book was and how helpful the information was. But now um, for nonfiction of that nature, they really want to also see what's your platform. Do they have a bunch of people they could sell this book to um, in addition to their own outreach beyond your audience? So that's kind of a big, you know, a bit of a hiccup for people in business and publishing today. Um, For memoir, it's it's kind of the same thing. It's not so much your audience size as, you know, it is still about how compelling that story is, but also how unique it is. So it's not just, you know, if you're if you're like a life coach and you know maybe you're doing something about divorce or helping people through divorce or something of that nature, um, it has to be more than just a compelling divorce story. It has to be really unique. So. Maybe you were um, 
you were a mail order bride and you were abandoned somewhere, you know, and you had to learn the language and start over by yourself, right? So there's a, there's a level of, um, it's called high concept that it has, it has to be like very media attention oriented, right? Cause we have such a loud world now. So that's mm-hmm. kind of the deal with the traditional publishing and the same goes for fiction is it not only has to be really well written and compelling and emotional, you know, big emotional read, but, um, a lot of times you also have to have the business platform to back it up. Um, it can also take a really long time to get published. Some books they can get out pretty fast. But sometimes it will take one to three years for you to see your book on the shelf from the day a publisher accepts it. And usually before a publisher accepts it, you have to get an agent to represent you. And that can some take, sometimes take months to years because that agent's the one who sells it to the publisher. So it's quite a long road for most people um, to break into traditional publishing, which is why with a lot of um, entrepreneurs these days, self-publishing is more the thing. Because you can sell to your own platform quickly, you can get it out there much more quickly, and so it just makes more sense if you do have a business supporting it. But there are times to go traditional. I would say for most people, it would be a few books down the line when you've got a pretty big platform and you can show a publisher that you've got an audience to reach. I love that. Now, when you say platform, let's just define that for people in case people may have a question about what does that really mean. Sure. So a platform is basically, you know, and and some of this is like a pretend numbers game because there's no guarantee all these people will buy from you. But a platform is the number of people who are presumably interested in your brand, your message, your stuff, and who would therefore be interested in buying it if it were to be presented to the market. So the number of people that follow you on all your different social media accounts, how many people are on your newsletter, depending on the kind of book, you're writing um, which social media outlet would be the most important. So for fiction authors and whatnot, it's generally Twitter, right? So if you're doing something for teenagers or youth, it would be one of the newer um, social media platforms that they're on. So it kind of depends on what you're writing. But that's basically your platform is the number of people that are engaged with you. And, it, you know, electronic numbers is basically what they're looking for um, in some form or another. Cool. So a clarifying question around that is, you know, I, I met someone who was really big on, I'm going to help you, you know, and here's a, just that, follow the step-by-step to increase your Twitter followers and this and that. And so here's my big, like, issue <laughs> with, mm-hmm. with especially Twitter is because it is a such a fast, Case environment that you really mm-hmm. have to be plugged in, not just once a day, but multiple times a day into a platform like mm-hmm. Twitter. And I personally, like, I think I, well, I technically have a Twitter account. I don't know the last time it's been updated. It's not right. my platform of choice. Right. And so you can, with, you know, the phase of, like, you can pay for leads, like, you can pay to have people like your stuff. Like, is what's the viability of just the numbers, you know, because there are people who have, you know, and I actually had someone who had, like, 100,000 followers or something, like, this crazy, crazy big number. Yeah. Yet, right. for traction to get sales to fill events was yes. really challenging. Yet, my, like, I had the exact opposite thing, and I was filling events with hundreds of people. Mm-hmm. And so, yep. it's just, like, what's the real number, and how much of that is really important? Like, what's really legitimate, and what are publishers really looking for if you decide mm-hmm. to go that route? Yep. So, um, the it's kind of silly, but in traditional publishing, the fake numbers matter too. They probably do look at like how long have these people been following you, and you know they probably do try to suss out how much of your following is real, which is probably why the newsletter is really relevant, right? And how long you've been on social media, and how often you are engaging, like how often people are engaging, as opposed to just the number of people following you, but how much engagement you get is also relevant to them. But there is an element of, you know, the fake numbers can count, too, in traditional publishing. But they don't really, like, that, that's what I'm saying. It's kind of silly because that doesn't really guarantee that those people are going to buy books from you. And that's why it's kind of a hard game because they're, they're basically, a traditional publisher is basically a venture capitalist. So they are investing in your brand as a writer or a maker-upper of ideas, so to speak, right? And mm-hmm. so they're just doing their very best to to take that shot in the dark or throw the spaghetti at the wall and hope it sticks. And so they're just trying to look for any evidence that they'll have a better chance of it sticking. 
So, yeah, they'll try to suss it out a little bit and see what's real. But, you know, the fake numbers kind of do matter in traditional publishing, which is why it can be kind of an annoying route to go at first. <laughs> with with self-publishing, those numbers are irrelevant. What matters is who can you really reach and how, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, self-publishing. So we we talked, you know, about the, the traditional publishing. It sounds like self-publishing is a shorter r- route, so it does not, it's not going to take as long. But what do people, what are some of the top mistakes that you see people make when they go the self-publishing route? Um, so the biggest mistakes are honestly not spending enough time on their actual book, their text, so that it's not, you know, it's not compelling, it's not well organized, it's not a good reader experience. They just kind of, you know, some, I mean, there, there are ways to get your book done fast, right, because everyone's a busy entrepreneur, but some people take that and that's called a draft and then they use that as their book that they publish, which is not what you should be doing if you want to develop that good brand loyalty. Um, so like, let's say you gather all a bunch of your social media posts and your PowerPoint presentations and your signature speech and you slap it all into a book. And I have seen this. I mean, people do publish this type of thing. Mm -hmm. It's very Mm -hmm. disorganized. It's not an emotionally compelling experience to read. You feel like you're kind of like pawing through the garbage to try to find the ring you lost, you know, like, oh, there must be a nugget (laughs) of wisdom in here somewhere. Right. And so, um, I see a lot of that. And then I see, so not only is the text itself, not going to create brand loyalty and people being interested in the next thing you have. But so it's, it's like a quick, you know, it's a quick way to make a quick buck, right? It's like you're selling something cheap on the street that goes out of fashion tomorrow. So you will you might make a quick buck on it if you have a platform, but you're not going to have that brand loyalty where the person's like, I love this person's ideas. I love what they talk about. I feel like I connect to them. You know, their story gives me hope. Like that's a big part of that vulnerability we talked about is if you can see where someone's been vulnerable and see where they've gotten, that gives you hope, right? And it also gives you loyalty to that person and their brand and everything they produce after because you feel like they're a person that you care about and connect to. So that's one of the biggest mistakes. And then also on the production end is they also slap it together from the production end. So like the design of the book and the layout is really sloppy. I mean, huge capitalization letter, you know, initial, Mm -hmm. like I see like all caps throughout their book constantly, which is like, I mean, it almost makes, it's like the book is screaming at you and your eyes are hurting, right? And Mm-hmm. And just weird fonts everywhere. And, I mean, you can just open it up and go, wow, that was not professionally produced, right? Yeah, <laughs> but people are trying yeah. to quickly get something out for their back-of-the-room sales, right? And and the reality is you can literally add maybe three months to your um, deadline to get your book out and have professional editing that helps you see, like a developmental editor saying, you know what? This idea doesn't make any sense. Like, you, it started strong and it wandered off into nowhere, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do with the takeaway now. And they can talk to you about how the story isn't really illustrating the point of what you're trying to say, but if you change these five lines, then the story would really powerfully illustrate that point. So, like, there's, it doesn't take too long to get a book edited and then to make sure you're having someone professional and, you know, take a little bit of time to make sure you know what that means to get the book produced, you can extend that by three months and have something that's beautiful and that's a legacy. And even if you're going to put out 10 10 books, you are um, building a brand off those instead of just throwing something at whoever's at your event and saying, here's my book. Um, Good luck reading it and getting something powerful out of it. I'm glad you bought it. Thanks for your 10 bucks, right? (laughs) So anyway, so it's just, you know, how much do you care about your brand? (laughs) Yeah, well, and it, what you said, it's a brand builder, and when we think yeah. that it doesn't matter, and and I remember actually one of my first coaches saying this because I, you know, done most of my graphic design, and and this was before she saw any of my graphic design. She didn't know I had a background, but when I said, yeah, I'm making my own website, she's like, Angela, it can be homemade, it just can't look homemade. And I was like, well, no, my background's like this. She's like, you know, so she her worry was a little bit alleviated, but I'll never right. forget <laughs> that it can be homemade, it just can't look homemade. And I, I recall yeah. as you were talking about this, two people I, I purchased a book from. Um, one, I got the book, and the color was so off. I was mm-hmm. just like. And, and because of, I think maybe I'm a little more, uh, I pay attention to those sure. details, but it's sure. like the person's hair is like this red-orange color. She's not a redhead, but the color was so off that I was like, that, wow, how the hell did this happen? I would be right. mortified if this was my book. And it was just, it just felt cheap. And I'm holding this book so excited to learn, but 
I have to admit, like my perception of this person's brand decreased by holding their book in my hand. And then the other one, which is recently, at first I waited a couple weeks to get it because apparently she was shipping her own books. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, no, don't do that. But I got it and it was not formatted correctly. Like like the back cover, like there was, you know, let's just say half an inch on one side and an inch on the other. And then the text was almost touching the top. And I look at stuff like that and I'm just just cringing going, like this is not acceptable. Like, I would freak right. out if this was my book, going, no way. And so I just thought, huh, where where were corners cut? Or where is quality control not being, you know, implemented here? Because it does right. affect your brand. Because I think it goes back to we are inundated with information. We're inundated with all the books mm-hmm. that we can buy or free webinars or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And so how do you stand out? Sometimes the quality itself of yes. the kind of paper it is. Like, are you holding it? And does it feel good? Like, you're excited about the book or it just can blend in with yeah. all the other books on your shelf. So I think it's no, just that's like what you talk about. Is there's a lot of value with that. It's so true. And, I mean, at, at the very least, all you have to do is walk into, you know, your Barnes & Noble or your local indie shop, right, and pick up something that's been produced by a traditional publisher and look at that and go, okay, how is this different than, you know, this this cheap looking homemade looking self published one, right? Like what are they doing? Like at the very least you could at least do that and look for patterns of what stands for quality. But I mean you know, hiring people that know what they're doing in that department because so I mean, you know, we all joke about like you get what you pay for isn't always true. But sometimes you get what you pay for is true. And so, <laughs> you know, you want to be careful on both ends. Like I see I see a lot of people take advantage of authors on different ends, right? So there's there's the people that are just pumping it out and it's super cheap. It's, it's practically do-it-yourself price cheap. And um, and those people are people who just taught themselves design like a week ago, right? And then there's like the opposite end where I see people making these promises. And this is, you know, kind of a promise to watch for, but these promises that you'll be a best-selling author if you use their team to publish your book. And like that right there should be a huge red flag because a traditional publisher who has, like, who can get you on the New York Times list through connections, (laughs) right, Mm -hmm. will not promise you a best-selling book. Um, And so they're charging people $28,000, $30,000, $40,000, you know, $12,000 minimum and on up. And those books are, in addition to the fact that they're, what they're doing is they're just giving you an Amazon algorithm in your um, search words that makes your book show up at the top of one tiny list somewhere for one day. And then they're, you know, slapping the Amazon bestseller title on your book, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not making your book a bestseller. You could have maybe sold 12 copies depending on the category you were in. And so you just spent twelve to $50,000 to sell your 12 copies. (laughs) But you now have the Amazon bestseller sticker, right? Um, Which could on some level maybe give you a little bit more credibility. You can now put in your bio, I'm a bestselling author, you know, sort of. But if your book still looks super homemade, even that little stamp on it is going to be suspicious, right? And you just spent tons of money for no return on your investment. Mm -hmm. And, and again, it's not going to build your brand long term. So, I mean, those are interesting services, and those are people who really know their SEO, but I'm not really sure how that helps anyone's business long term. And so that's just something to watch for. I mean, like you were saying about the quality standing out, I was at a a conference recently, and people were literally walking across this giant room because this cover was attracting their attention from across the room. It was this beautiful cover on this book, and the colors in it were just astounding, and the imagery was astounding, and it was like literally like people would walk across the room to go see what this book was. And I'm like, that right there is evidence of why this, why quality matters. Because it really does. Like, and people were buying the book because of the cover. They would read the back and go, oh, that sounds good, maybe. But they were buying the book because the cover was making a promise that the rest of the book must probably be amazing, too. So it's a very interesting experience for me to watch that. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that about the Amazon bestsellers because it's not about, well, you know, let's just go there for a second. (laughs) Because I remember being kind of like, oh, my gosh, I could be an Amazon bestseller. Like, what does that mean? And not yeah. to discredit the power of what that could do, but it's sure. actually quite easy to do that. You know, like mm-hmm. there's a pretty simple formula and a strategy. A lot of people do it. Not Again, not that it's not, you know, a good thing, but if you're putting all your eggs in one basket and if you're, you know, paying, you know, ten to $50,000, and I've seen this, like we're going to help you be an Amazon bestseller, 
Um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna just tell you right up front like you're paying too much because you can do that you can probably Google it for free. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's not all it's cracked up to be and what people don't understand is it's not about the number of books. Like in yeah. order to be a New York Times bestselling author, you probably know the number, but it's like you have to sell a certain number of books. It's not about you're in this kind of quirky category in Amazon and yeah. you sold like you said 12 books, but it was 12 more than anyone else in that category. So Amazon's going to give you that sticker of Amazon bestseller. And this right. is not about again being pessimistic or anything that way. Yeah. But it's about educating yourself about what does this really mean. Yeah. So if someone is going to say, I'm going to get you on a bestseller list, like, what does that really mean? How many books does that mean? And if there's not a number, you might want to ask some other questions because it may not yes. be what you're looking for. Yes, that is such a good point. And I think that kind of goes back to what we were talking about. It's the biggest mistake I see is people rushing their process. Um, and, you know, it's hard to know where to find the right info because the Internet's covered in information, right? But um, generally speaking, I mean, the best way to find info is ask for referrals. Ask for people who you see they have produced a book and it is lovely and it is done well and the text itself and the story and the message are done well and ask them, hey, who helped you produce your book, right? Where did you learn about this? Um, if, you know, obviously listening to podcasts, I mean, get online and listen to podcasts. Generally, you're, you're usually going to have more of an expert on a podcast as opposed to somebody's random blog on the Internet, right? Um, or somebody's r- random, you know, pricing description of what they can do for your book. Um, be, find just a few, take 10 minutes and find a few um, podcasts to listen to so you have an idea of, like, whatever industry you're going into, be it publishing or anything else, right? Give yourself a few minutes of self-education so you can start asking the right questions, and don't be rushing things. And definitely don't, if you're working with anyone that's putting you under pressure to make decisions quickly, That's also a red flag that you don't want to be going in that direction. So, yeah, again, all of those things, like you're saying, they play into a bigger strategy. So if you are doing everything right with the quality book, you know how you're developing your platform, your book is leading people back to your website or your product, right? Like there's a, you know, in the back of your book, you have a CTA, a call to action that says, hey, if you love these ideas about how to do whatever, go get my free download on the website that has, you know, this chart that helps you execute that process, whatever it is. Um, If you're putting all those pieces in place and then you also pay to have the Amazon, you know, I wouldn't say pay $12,000, definitely find a better vendor, but you're paying something to, or learning it to get that status. And then you're adding that to the rest of the strategy you have in place. That's great. People can put that on there. It does look good. It helps people, but it makes a lot more sense if it's part of an overall strategy and you know what you're doing and you know why, as opposed to just, having a pipe dream of, oh, these people made me this promise, I'll just dive into that. So I definitely, it's the go slightly slower. You don't have to, like, take 100 years. Just go slightly slower. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, there's that saying of, like, you can have a cheap, fast, or high quality, but you can only choose two of the three. <laughs> you know, I right. think that's a, something like that. It's just, like, right. you know, quality matters, and you're either going to pay in dollars and or yeah. time, but if it's a rush job, like really just ask, like, what kind of quality do you want to put out there? And I've actually been tempted with this. You know, we've had the conversation, like, hey, I want to have this book by blah, 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 and I'm speaking at this event, and, and I could feel this angst of, like, I yeah. want to have this thing produced, and it's like, I'm not, I'm not comfortable creating what I want to create, and the quality I want mm-hmm. to see, I'm going to find a different option for the speaking gig that I'm doing in September. Like, there's going to be right. something different because I don't want to put my name on something that I am not 100% thrilled about the time, the quality, and what I'm putting into it. And so right. sometimes as entrepreneurs, we have to make that decision. So let's mm-hmm. just, you know, we've got a few minutes left, and I would just love to wrap up with how can people use a book because it's not just about adding the, oh, I'm an author to your bio. Like, that can be cool, mm-hmm. and that feels good, and there's something about I think the personal satisfaction is when you're holding a book in your hand. But how are some ways that you're seeing that actually books are being underutilized, especially for entrepreneurs? And what suggestions do you have about that? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so definitely, so most people that are making um, the most of their books are also doing either speaking or coaching. So they're supplementing, the book is supplementing their speaking and vice versa, right? So they're they're teaching or coaching at events, and then the people that are so excited to learn what they're doing at the events then get to go and purchase something they can take home with them that can expand on that knowledge, 
or even just remind them so they don't forget all of it, right? And it's got some great details. And, and, you know, some people like to do, like, they'll take their signature speech and put it into a book. And that's fine um, if you're going to put that out, say, on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and publish it traditionally. So not like that guy you were talking about that's just shipping her own book. But if you're going to actually publish it for real in the world and put it out there so people can buy it online, then your signature speech is a way to introduce people to you and your philosophy and what you do. And that can really expand um, your book across the world. I mean, quite honestly, um, you can start bringing in customers globally because that's the first chance they have to be exposed to your book because it's on Amazon UK or something, right? And so they're Googling, I need to know how to do something, and they find your signature speech book, which, of course, should be leading them back to your website in some way for a freebie, right? Because you want them signed on in your newsletter, and they want you want them to start engaging with you and your brand and what else you can offer them. Um, the other thing is, of course, you know, those events. Like, if you're going to do a book for your event, then you don't want just the signature speech. Because that's what a lot of people do is they get the signature speech to sell it at the back of the event. But if I just listen to your signature speech and I'm really excited about your ideas and I go get your book and it's just your signature speech, I'm going to be yeah. like, well, okay, that was inspiring, but I don't want to read that over 50 times. I want to find out what to do next. And mm -hmm. so there's kind of, you know, you need to strategize and think carefully about what are you doing with this thing that you're producing? Because if you want to sell something at your events, then you want to sell something that's going to take them to the next level. So then they're excited to go to your website again and get the free download for something and go to the next level and go to the next level. And, and just in terms of engaging with you on any level. Um, and so those are kind of two ways that I see people using them wrong is they'll just produce their book and then just sell it locally and not use it to expand their audience. Or they'll, they'll just produce a book that doesn't add to what they're already offering. Um, and so you want to think of it carefully as an actual strategy as part of your business. Think of it more like an information product or a coaching. Imagine if it were like a coaching program, right? Like mm -hmm. how are you using it? What are your people supposed to get out of it? What can they do with it? What applicable ideas are in it? Um, and what do you want them to do with the book once they've read it? Like what are they going to do as their next steps? And what do you want them to do with you in terms of engagement? And all of that needs to be worked into the book in a very sincere and genuine way um, of getting them to realize that you're there to help them, right? And so those are some of the bigger things. You can also use it for, you know, like corporate gifts or whatnot, right? If you're, if you're trying to, you know, if you're introducing yourself to people or chatting with people, you know, sometimes you can give your book as a, a gift to someone if it doesn't seem really tacky and self-serving, right? <laughs> if, the, if the situation <laughs> seems natural, but that's the way that people can get connected to you and get to know you better, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also kind of unique distribution options. If you're if you're doing nonfiction and you're in that world, um, there are distributors that you can get connected with that can get your book into airports or they can do large sales to like the military or to hospitals or things of that nature where, you know, um, if you get a big sale, the books are non-returnable, so you don't have to worry about printing 5,000 books to the military, and then they say, just kidding, and you have to eat those costs. But, like, you, there's some of those kind of options, too, where you can get a big sale outside. So I know a few marketers that specialize in kind of all those crazy niche markets that you don't think about. And depending on your topic, that can really be something to look into because people can really sell thousands and thousands of books in a niche market if they just kind of investigate distribution and different sales markets and how do you get into those channels, you know, how do you get your book, you know, displayed or, or um, talked about on this particular type of um, site or podcast, because that's the number one site in the world for people who love ninja gardening or whatever it is. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, those yeah. are things people don't ever look into is they just think, okay, I just publish a book. I just, I just saw the events and it's just on Amazon. They don't ever look into all those amazing niche um, connections that they could maybe have and they could make almost all their income from one place, you know, Gardeners yeah. of America, you know, group <laughs> or something. Yeah. So just those are really interesting things I've seen that, and you can also do crossover. Like I was saying how with my business, I ended up working, you know, I followed my bliss quote unquote in the sense that I ended up working in the field that I love with books and words and publishing, but in a different way than I was expecting. And the same thing can apply to, like the books that you're writing and what you're trying to do with your business. I have a, one of our clients, her primary business is that she sells makeup, but her book is about self-esteem and your inner beauty. And so any inspirational speaking she does has to do with self-esteem and inner beauty and confidence 
Um, but it ties back into her makeup business in ways that are very genuine and sincere and, and don't feel forced at all. And so she sells a ton of these books just through her business clients because she's teaching them to do makeup and to feel good about themselves and, and how to feel confident. And then her book is following up on those principles in ways that have to do with their inner transformation. So there's there's ways that you can also, even if you're in a business that you don't think is relevant to a book, you might be surprised that there might be a way to, to draw on that power. That's awesome. Well, one of, you know, one of the things that I've worked on with my clients who are helping them with their business and they want to write a book, we actually start with a marketing plan first. And then I refer mm-hmm. them to someone like you like for the actual writing, editing, publishing, yes. distributing, you know, all that piece. Right. But to start with the end in mind, like, what are you going to do with this book? Because then you can reverse engineer it just a little bit. Yes. Of what calls to action can you put throughout the book? Or what client stories can you use that are compelling stories? Mm-hmm. And it's illustrating of the transformation that happens when you work with a client, for example. So some of these mm-hmm. things that's not, you know, especially for entrepreneurs who are writing nonfiction, like, like this is a marketing piece. Yes. And so where is it leading people to? So be thinking about, you know, that um, – really throughout the entire process. And like I said, when I help clients create their marketing plan for their book, they actually start with a marketing plan and then they go off and write and then they've got this plan. And of course, there are you know, usually some adjustments and tweaks, but sure. they know what they're doing. And I found that it makes the writing process easier because they know how to actually get it in front of people. And it's more exciting yeah. because they know, oh, it's not just going to sit there. Like, they're really excited about yeah. getting the book out. So it's a really great motivator <laughs> to get the writing done. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so, too. And and also, like, what you're talking about with the that big picture first. Like, you and I had talked once about the, the problem people have is, which idea do I start with? Like, I have all these things I could teach or talk about. Mm. Um, and the idea of, of looking at from a marketing standpoint first and, like, where do you want things to go can really be what guides you – to know what to start with. Like, um, I'm trying to think of this here. I think it's David Bach's series. He's a money guy, right, at the money book. Mm -hmm. But he started out with this book um, about, you know, how to retire rich or whatever it was. And he started with a general one that applied to most people in a general sense, like it was the principles. And then he did the spin-off of the one just for women or just for single women and then just for couples and then just for people really close to retirement and then just for grandmas who love motorcycles, right? Like it was just like, it was like he took it and he went off with all the little tangents. And that's one of the things that I see people struggle with is they teach all this stuff, but it's slightly different for the female audience and slightly different for this audience and slightly different for that audience. And so they never quite know, you know, most of their customers are this type of customer, but, and so they get all confused about where to start and what to cover. And so sometimes you can look at that big picture and say, well, who, you know, do you want to just focus on this audience and become the guru in the world for that audience? Or do you want to be the person who does the general and that's a totally different kind of marketing and then does spin off, right? And so there's different, or are you walking a very particular customer avatar through a very particular process? And so each of your books moves them towards something. And so that's a really great way to look at even like, how do you decide what to write first and what to focus on is, you know, what are your long-term goals? Who do you want to be? What kind of business are you running? And then how is that book going to support you? And so then which audience and which subtopic do you start with? And sometimes that means you write the definitive work on something. And sometimes that means you just look at the very small problem that you are solving the most for your customers that you're very, very good at. And you write a 10,000 word mini book on just solving that problem. So instead of Everything you need to know about negotiating employees, hiring and firing and communication, it's um, how to have difficult conversations with X kind of employee, right? And so you can you can start out with something that is just for the audience you already have to bring in more revenue, and then you can expand that out to the world or you can go the other way. So there's just – there's so many ways you can do it, and it's really unique to you. There's not a formula of this is how you build a business with a book, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that example because I think that's one of the ways that I've stopped myself from creating content. And when you think about book, you know, writing a book is just one of the ways that you can create content and share with the world. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so if writing, you know, is not your thing, like consider the other possibilities. Are there audios or videos? Like, like it's, yes. the world is so much more broad 
than I think it ever has been. And I don't know that that's ever going to change. And so Mm -hmm. the world, I mean, like there's really a blank canvas. And so, you know, conversations like this are so powerful and so useful of helping people decide, like, what is it that you really want to do? That's such a great example. of Maybe it is, you know, a mini book that is solving one specific problem. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I'm just just going to throw this out there is I've just been noticing more and more is because we're so inundated with information, it can be overwhelming. So Mm -hmm. perhaps your audience that you're trying to reach will be very relieved to have just a quick, short read that's solving one problem, but that's Mm -hmm. enough to get them in in your world. And I can't remember the stat. Maybe you know that, you know, the average person reads a certain percentage of the book, but they never finish it. And I don't know, Mm -hmm. like, what that is, but, like, that's really fascinating. And, and if your complete message has to be delivered by people reading the entire book, mm-hmm. then people may not be getting what you're really wanting to deliver. So what else is possible there? That it's like, well, how can you, are you going to kind of serve this very instant gratification society <laughs> that we're all yes. turning into? Um, yes, very your much message so. out there. Well, very much so. And also in terms of your specific, um, you know, we use the word customer avatar, but like the person you're trying to serve, right? Mm -hmm. Um, That person also is going to dictate which idea you start with in terms of, um, is this uh, an entrepreneur that is juggling 5,000 million hats, starting a business by themselves, they don't have funding, they're totally overwhelmed, or is this someone in a retirement phase of life who has free time to read? a big long book on the 50 steps to have a million dollars by the time you're 72, right? Like, I mean, you, you know, you think through those things, like think about what that person's life is like and what they're doing. And and that's part of um, what you're going to be doing with your book. And I love that you mentioned the audio and the video. I mean, today there are so many ways to spread that message of your book. I mean, there are people that don't have time to read. I mean, I would say for everyone, get your book on audio. Absolutely no matter what, have it available for download on iTunes and Audible and Stitcher and all of that. Um, And then there's the whole workbook concept too, that, you know, that's when you're, you've really drawn people into your, your newsletter, into your, you know, they're interacting with you on your site and your events is then you can have um, workbooks that go with, you know, the informational books. So, I mean, there's just, there's so many ways that you can create that content and share it with the broadest audience possible. And I I would almost say to people, don't, um, don't be, you know, don't have that perfection paralysis. Like if you learn all this and you just cannot figure out where to start, just start with something that makes sense for you that you can be genuine and sincere and truly helpful about and get that book out there. And as you see how people are responding to that book, that can give you insights about where to go next because there's not like the perfect way to go. I mean, people's businesses shift all the time. And so sometimes there's just that engagement piece where, you need to get something out there just like with any other information product or coaching program so you can engage with it and see how to make tweaks. And that's the beauty of self-publishing too, is you can pull your book at any moment, redo it, retitle it, redo the cover, change what it's about, stick it back up online. Like you have all that control. And so it's not this big, terrible, like I just released this book and now I believe everything different about what I just shared and it's out there forever. And, <laughs> you know, like it's not I've that had a change of heart. <laughs> Right, and oh, if you have funny. the 50,000 copies in your garage that you have to sell or you can't pay your mortgage, right? <laughs> yeah. like, it's just not like that anymore. So, Oh, that's awesome. Well, I know that you have a free gift, so when you guys go to Angela Johnson, that's again with double L, AngelaJohnson.com forward slash podcast, look for Angela Eschler for interview, and you will find some amazing information about the steps to publish and self-publishing. And I mean, and I've seen the, the, the guts of this guy is such phenomenal information. I honestly can't believe that you give it away for free. So tell us a little <laughs> bit more about that um, when they when they go there and download that. Yeah, so what you'll get with that is, like we were talking about the take 10 minutes to educate yourself so you know the right questions to ask. What you're basically getting from that guide is um, what a traditional publisher does to create a really quality book. Because, re- you know, one of the reasons they're so competitive or, or um, they take so long to get out there is they're creating a really quality book. Um, from the different, you know, there's different types of editorial. There's the developmental editing, and then there's the prose execution or deep line editing, which is like your voice and your style and how compelling the rhythm of your sentences is, right? And then there's like the copy editing, which is looking for inconsistencies in grammar. And, and then there's proofreading, which is the final, you know, third set of eyes. It's making sure that nobody missed any typos, right? And so it basically walks you through like, here's all the steps 
that a traditional publisher would do to produce a quality book. Here's how they're all defined. This is what they look like. So if you go to hire an editor, how do you know you're getting the right type for what you need and which order you do them? It has all that information. And then it has these charts that walk you through those steps and give you the timelines. So if you're going to produce a book and you want it by, you know, November, when does that book need to be finished for the editorial process? And how many weeks do you need for shipping and for the production end and the design and the cover? And it just walks you backwards so that you can set a, a good deadline that's realistic without just going, well, I want the book in November and it's three months away and you think that's normal. And then you find yourself going crazy with stress, scrambling to get that out for your event because you had no idea that you really should have given yourself six months to produce a book. So it just, it really walks you through all those so you can plan that quality book that's a legacy for you. And it gives you the information you need to start asking the right questions that you know you're getting professionals on your team and things of that nature. Brilliant. So any final words of wisdom that you have for people who are either in the process of writing a book, who would like to write a book, especially for those of you listening that, you know, this might be a little bit overwhelming because we've covered a lot of ground in a short period of time mm -hmm. and we could have talked for hours and hours more. Right. Any final words of wisdom that you have for people? You know, I would say this. If you feel like, if you feel like you need to be writing a book because it's that one more I'm supposed to do to build a business rule that you're hearing all over the place, I would take a step back and breathe because not every single business strategy in the world applies to every single business. So give yourself some space to not freak out and think it's one more should that you should do. And that at any point it might be the right thing for you to do. You might want to do it in a year from now when you have enough blog posts that you could make that into a book, right? So that you can leverage your time. So take some space there and just breathe. If you're feeling like, this really strong personal and, you know, intuitive, inspirational drive that you need to get your story or message in a book form, then um, definitely follow that. Just know that you don't need to put all the pressure on yourself. Like if you have a message to share and it's meaningful, it will touch people's lives. Like I've been amazed at, you know, even, you know, we kind of make fun of romance novels, even though it's the number one selling genre in the entire world. <laughs> and you can make more money as a romance novelist than any kind of writing ever, right? Oh, <laughs> so funny. it's like an incredibly viable career, actually. But um, we even joke, you know, the, the fluffy romance novel, right? Like it's supposed to be this quintessential, not important thing that's not contributing to the world. And I would say that if you're writing a true vulnerable, unique book that has heart in it, that tells it, that tells the story in a way that is, you know, like we talked about, has vulnerability in it, um, and it, and you're intending to serve people, that book, no matter how not perfect it is, can still serve people. I've known, I knew a girl that, um, one of my friends, like a, her a sibling was down and out and living homeless and addicted to drugs, and her kids were who knows where being cared for by relatives, and she was living in her car. And someone gave her, <laughs> this is crazy to me, someone, she picked up a romance novel somewhere and something in that story literally touched her. She pulled her life together, got her kids back, got a job, <laughs> got off drugs from a romance novel, wow. right? Wow. And I just, you know, I always think about that whenever you're not, whenever you're not feeling humble or when you're feeling like literary snob, right? I just think <laughs> if there, if you have a message to share in whatever way, if you feel compelled to do that, that's probably because there is someone in the world that needs it and they need it through your voice, right? So anyway, so there's my little piece of inspiration is don't, don't, you know, now that we've told you, make sure it's perfect and beautiful and it's your legacy, don't feel pressure. <laughs> But that, you know, take your time to do that. You don't have to do everything today, but your message will help someone and it will be meaningful. I mean, I've written a couple books and, you know, they sold well, but the sales numbers is never anything. Like you don't go to bed and you think, wow, that was an amazingly powerful day. I sold seven more books, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you go to bed and you think about that conversation you had. But this is crazy for me, but I, I was writing a book for women. It was an inspirational book for women. And this 80-year-old gentleman sat down with me at a book signing and said, I just want you to know what your book meant to me. And he started crying. I'm sorry, this is so ridiculous. He started crying, oh. and I started crying, and I don't even know this guy. And we're, like, holding hands across the table talking about this topic that was meaningful for both our lives, right? Oh. And I went home, and I thought, that is the craziest thing in the world. 
You know, like I don't, of all, I never imagined in a million years that anything like that would happen from writing this book. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. So just like those yeah. are the things that stick with you. It's not, oh, wow, I sold 100 copies. What sticks with you is seeing that whatever you put in the world um, touched and moved and helped someone else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's that's beautiful. That's a perfect note to end on. So again, go to <laughs> AngelaJohnson.com forward slash podcast. Look for Angela Eschler's interview, and you'll find this guide that she's given you along with her contact information. Um, so any of you who are wanting to write a book or in the process of writing a book, I hands down recommend Angela. Like, I'm so excited to work on my book with you. Um, and I know Angela and Angela, you know, she's also tall and dark hair. So, and she's from Utah. So, you know, we've got that going on too. So, well, thank you so much for your expertise, for your generosity, and just for assisting people for getting their message out into the world. So that those conversations of someone, you know, holding hands with you across the table of you've made an impact on a human being's life. Like that is such powerful work. So thank you for for what you are contributing to the planet and for these authors who are passionate about getting their message out. So see you guys on the next episode. Bye for now, everybody. <laughs>